Hello and welcome everybody to Battlefield Podcast, uh, sort of the Labor Day weekend edition. This is episode 134, and yes, we are back to doing Battlefield Podcast. Um, we're back to the old numbering scheme, so we've gone through 120 episodes before we did season 3. We did 13 episodes of that, so now we're just going to go back to just straight numbers. It's easier on my brain, so I don't have to keep worrying about what the, what the numbering scheme is going to be uh, this particular week. Um... This week we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the Battlefield news over the past two weeks, and we're also going to talk to our special guest, which we'll introduce in a second. Um, for now, though, I want to introduce my co-host. First of all, I am Ola, aka Chalk One, and with me, as always, is Tim, aka Darkness Four Two Nine. And as you may have noticed, we changed the video format around a little bit. Less less boxes, more video. We will still be showing some gameplay footage during the show later on during snippets in fact our guest was uh, kind enough to provide some of that footage for us so we can use that and uh might as well introduce him right now we're going to be talking with Dasgro this week of youtube weapon fame i guess <laughs> 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 why don't you uh tell us a little bit about yourself and how you what what it is that you do in regards to battlefield 3 and youtube uh well again my name is Dasgro. i'm do sort of Two main things on YouTube with Battlefield 3. The first one is sort of the gun comparison videos. I take a gun in real life, one that either I own or I can get access to, and I compare it to the gun in game. And I know a lot of people don't sort of like the idea of those two cultures colliding, but I'm a big gun guy and I'm a big Battlefield guy. I want to sort of give people a taste for both. And then the second thing that I do is I do competitive commentaries and match analysis and things like that, sort of like what Day 9 does with StarCraft. I've been a part of the competitive Battlefield scene for the last 10 years, been a lot of top teams, have played a number of different types of leagues and ladders and matches and things like that and so it's my way of giving back to the to that competitive community and hopefully getting it some more spotlight and people can find you on youtube obviously uh username dasgro that's right and so well, yeah we'll be talking a little bit later about some some specific armor stuff when um, obviously armored kill is just around the corner a couple weeks now well, actually less than just a couple days for those people on the ps3 um, which is cool. I just noticed that Twitch now plays advertisements, eh? Right in the middle of the show, which is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta like that. Um, but yeah, we want to thank Battlefield, oh, by the way, for letting us use their Twitch stream, um, as always. And we're going to be posting the episode at battlefield.com probably tomorrow after I've done some final editing and, and clean up on the audio and stuff like that. And obviously, you can find, a, find it in iTunes if you search for Battlefield Podcast and uh, at youtube.com slash battlefieldpodcast as well for the video version. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some news. Tim, why don't you tell us a little bit about what this August premium content drop was that hit a couple days ago? Uh, well, with the August premium drop, we uh, a lot of people were looking forward to what they thought were going to be more in-game um, content, maybe more soldier perks, weapon camos, uh, what have you. But we didn't see that. We had a uh, armored kill uh, teaser. It was a really cool premium video that released. Uh, our friend Snoken over at Dice did a really really good job with it. Um, it highlighted a lot of the um, somewhat the the unknowns we that we were kind of looking forward to with the uh, with the game. We saw um, the new night map that they were um, they've been kind of teasing here and there. Um, I'm really excited for it. It looks great. Yeah, it was it was nice actually. It was quite a bit of footage, quite a bit of long, just cut to you know straight on gameplay footage, which was nice to see. So, right. uh, a little and, bit of benefit. You also, you also got the uh, the really cool concept drawings, and I think Ola, you actually have a printout. I I did. I know a lot of people were not very excited about this particular content drop, but you know it's a little bit different than something in-game or, or some kind of a benefit to people playing. But it is kind of cool artwork nevertheless. And I went went through the exercise of figuring, you know what, I'll go print one of these out and actually have it printed at Photo Lab and then I framed it. I don't know how well it's going to show up on on the video, but it's it's not bad. It's pretty cool artwork. And considering that you can just extract it from the PDF file and print it for a couple of bucks and put it in like a $2 frame, you know, it's it's a pretty good bonus, I thought. Yeah, and it's, it's great. You can turn it into wallpapers or whatever you want to do with it. I guess, yeah, I don't know what the resolution would be to get it into a wallpaper, but there's there's a few of them certainly that are uh, worthwhile to print out that, that look pretty cool. And and it's just an 8x10 is what I put it in, and that looks looks pretty good. Pretty good. Um, speaking of the trailer for Armored Kill, or the footage of it, uh, there was also some 
some rumors, I guess, uh, started by Roly the Poly, who we had on the podcast a couple of weeks back, talking about, uh, I guess, what people are inferring to be a new Armored Kill trailer. Um, <laughs> and he just said, and I quote, holy shit, this next one is going to be total bonkers, just some more tweaks and we're done, hashtag Armored Kill. So we're assuming it's a trailer, because obviously that's, that's what he does. Yeah, I don't know what else they're going to show. I mean, the game's coming out very soon, and they've sh- they've highlighted a lot of the uh, the new things coming out. So, whatever he has, I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Yes, should be good. Um, the other thing we've heard in the past a lot about official dice servers lacking in quantity on the consoles, um, mm-hmm. and I guess that has been addressed. Where there was actually a post at uh, the Battlefield blog that they have effectively quadrupled the dice servers on the PS3 and the Xbox 360. So um, best thing to do would be to search for dice when you're looking for servers. Now, I know in the past somebody's told us there's actually quite a few people who name their servers and include dice in their server names so that uh, yeah, really. there's some confusion over it. But I think the, the key thing to remember is that if you find a server that is either an official dice server or a server that you like, just add it to your favorites. I, mean, I probably go through only a handful of servers that I play on on a regular basis. Right. Um, you know, once you're familiar with the admins and whatnot. Now, well, and Tim, I have, a, I have a question about that as well. I don't, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, one of the things that I one of the things that I saw quite a bit uh, in the console world was how that there was a lot of a lot of critique and complaining, and I'm not saying so founded on the fact that there were a number of servers run by sort of rogue administrators, those that had sort of very arbitrary or often. Um, uh, questionable rule sets, or worse yet, just had power uh, power admins. Admins were just going on a power trip, that kind of thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And it, it's sort of a, I find it very interesting that that has sort of manifested so, so much uh, in the consoles. I remember going back to like Battlefield 942 or Battlefield Vietnam, where there were a few dice servers, but there were really a lot more uh, community-driven servers, and I, I want to use that word community and emphasize it, because those servers were in place because you could create communities of people around playing together, and that's sort of how these early clans, if you will, got started together, because they all joined the same server, they all played together, and this was well before Battlelog, or Adam Friends, or Xbox Live, or what have you, and so it was, it's sort of, I find it very fascinating that, that now, nearly 10 years after the first game has come out, that now when we think of of non dice servers. It's associated with these these admins on a power trip and doing things that sort of make the game not as fun. Yeah, especially on the console side, that seems to be more prevalent of a problem there. I I, I, I think I attribute it to the fact that we've on the PC side been used to just having uh, custom servers, custom rules, admins that uh, sometimes abuse their power or certainly um, influence the server in whatever fashion they they like do you play on the ps uh, on the pc or consoles mostly uh, i'm an exclusive pc gamer uh, i don't really foray that much into the consoles unfortunately and so it's hard for me to speak with much authority in regards to you know how that you know, community you know, feels about certain things most of my interaction with it is actually on uh, on reddit.com's uh, battlefield 3 sub community right yeah there's there's a lot it's it's quite different the, the community and the feeling about servers and admins between consoles and the PC. It's very interesting. I I, I also play uh, on the PC exclusively, even though I, I feel tempted sometimes to check it out on the consoles just to get a, a, a feel for what it's like there, because it does seem to be quite a bit different. Um, you know, one of the things that's obviously always different is the map sizes uh, and, and the map setups between the different systems. And... Uh, the Inside Dice blog post, uh, they had a new article just posted a few days ago about taking terrain to new heights in Armor Kill. And I think they sort of meant that literally because a lot of the, especially the, the snow maps are, um, you know, it's it's in the mountains. So you do have quite a bit of altitude differences. And it's um, it's an interesting read. And there's also a really cool fly-through video through the map Albor's Mountain, which is the snow map. So it's a good example of what what that looks like. And... And I think people are quite excited for the snow map, actually. Yeah, they did a really good job showcasing the amount of details that's going to go into uh, these new maps. I mean, they've already done a, a great amount of detail in the vanilla maps and the, the back to car game maps, but just looking at the things that they highlighted in this video was really cool. Uh, just the leaves and the moss and the, the dirt, the ice. It was really, really neat to see what Andrew Hamilton has done, um, their lead uh, environmental artist. 
Yeah, they certainly put a lot of effort into into these, and and I think we're all looking forward to trying them out in a couple of weeks. The the official release date is the fourth of September for PlayStation Three premium members, and then September eleventh for uh, the other systems premium members, and then probably within the next couple of weeks after that for everybody else. So mm. two weeks, I guess, after premium release for everyone else. Um, it gets more complicated with the introduction of premium and the PS3 having it a week earlier really than that. Uh, it, it's a little bit more interesting now as far as when things come out, but a uh, few weeks' time, I guess, for most people. Um, the other thing that they have posted at Battlefield.com, actually it was posted right on Battlelog, is that they're doing a new contest that they call the Pitch Your Battlefield Map concept. So mm -hmm. um, it's a competition. They've done similar competitions to this before, but basically... Um, they want you to pitch sort of a high-level idea for a map, for a battlefield map. So it's similar to the process that I guess they go through at DICE where they sit down and somebody has an idea, you know, it would be really cool to create a map that is, uh, you know, an, an old abandoned factory. They show, show some early concept art for, um, what's it called? Brain fart right now. <laughs> the scrap one metal? Close quarters. Yeah, scrap, scrap metal. metal, there you go. So, you know, they want you to... to they go through an example of sort of the high-level ideas that you're supposed to submit, and um, there'll be 10 winners that will receive an extremely limited edition signed lithograph with Battlefield artwork. Sort, mm. of, sort of like the one I made myself without the signature. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, I think it's sort of a really neat way for the folks out there that, that do dabble in map editing. I know we don't have mod tools for Battlefield 3, so there's a lot right. of people who in the past have gotten <laughs> have gotten uh, into creating custom maps but i guess this is some way to to show dice that you have sort of a cool idea i don't know if they'd ever use that in the future or uh, get involved with that but it wouldn't be the first time i mean a lot of people who work at dice now have been involved in the mod community of previous iterations right. of battlefield in some way or another so exactly there's always that yeah i'm i'm looking forward to that i hope they get some really good map ideas i sort of harken back to the days of Battlefield 42 Road to Rome and, and some of those maps, like a mm. Operation Baytown or even a, a Monte Casino. I, I think of Operation Metro, sort of this grind that a lot of people like to play, this infantry crazy grind. I could see people loving Monte Casino because it's this big uphill battle trying to get to that castle. And then you mm. throw in a high Mars in there, throw in some tanks in there, and it's, it'd be a grind fest. And I, you know, I, I still can't believe some people like playing Metro, but... People like it, and I think those kind those kind of maps would be really cool to sort of reincorporate into uh, back into the franchise. It would be cool. So now with uh, Armored Kill just around the corner, and um, some of the obviously the focus on armor, hence the name. But uh, um, so Dasker, you when you play competitively Battlefield Three, or or yeah, I guess I guess you'd say, would you call it competitively? Yeah, when you, I mean, it's eSports or Pro Battlefield 3 or Competitive Battlefield 3. There's a lot of different nomenclature you know, thrown at it, but it's basically people who, who are on two sides in a private server playing the given set of rules and just playing against each other. So it's not really a pub in the sense that you have a random guy going mortar for no reason. You're there with your friends, with your teammates, and you're playing against another team that has the same set of circumstances, and it's, it's battling each other in terms of better strategies and better skills and, and better maneuver and everything's done around those lines. And and some game modes incorporate just imagery and some have everything. So just yesterday I played in a 32 versus 32 organized match and it was intense. It was combined arms. You had the jets and helicopters and the tanks and the Vodniks. It was really quite you know, a lot of fun. So that's sort of what I mean by competitive. Right. And, and what led you to, we'll talk a little bit more about armor and we'll play some of the footage from some of your competitive matches in a bit, but what led you to, you mentioned earlier that you enjoy real life weapons, that you're, you're into that stuff. So what, uh, I guess what brought you to the idea of taking some of the in-game weapons that we know DICE sort of puts a lot of effort into uh, trying to get the sounds right and the feel of the weapons uh, at least that's my assumption. I don't know nothing about real life guns, so, but it it seems <laughs> right. it seems it's like fine. they've done a good job. Um, but what got you into the idea of actually comparing it to the real life weapons? Well, I had uh, back in Battlefield Two. My role in the competitive community was a tanker, and that's all I've been doing 
for the entire 10 years of my competitive experience has been tanking. And the gun for the for the MEC coalition or the Middle Eastern coalition in Battlefield 2 was a Sega 12 shotgun. And I didn't, I, I was so surprised that you could buy Sega 12 shotguns in real life. And so uh, I had a few guns already, but I, I bought this one. And so, and I got it converted to look just like the Sega 12 in Battlefield 2. And I just started, you know, buying guns here and there. And some were buying because of Battlefield, but a lot of them were not. And, and eventually... After getting to Battlefield 3, I sort of took a, an inventory of my collection and realized that I had a lot of the guns in this game and <laughs> found that it was kind of surprising that, that no one really has talked about real-life comparisons between the two. You've got a few guys that have done videos that saying, in real life, this gun is used by so-and-so military <laughs> unit, and it does. I mean, they're basically going to Wikipedia, they're reading the Wiki Wikipedia page, and that's it. Right. That's fine and all, and I'm not, I'm not dissing on that, but... I wanted a little bit more than that, and so I had a, a a few cameras that I could set up, and I this is just some helmet mounted cameras, that kind of thing, and I just would go to the range like I always do. I go I go to a range once a week on average. So I said, well, I'll just bring the camera this time and do some shooting. Yeah, and it's very interesting to see. I'm playing the one video about the uh, Benelli M1014 shotgun right now, and it's very interesting to see how you do the split screen between the real life gun in your hands on the left, and then in game footage on the right, which is. Which, which I think is uh, it's actually really cool to see, just how like the reload um, movements, obviously, <laughs> real yeah. life animation. But uh, now, now I make no I make no claim to be some kind of, of of top shot operator or anything around those lines. I'm just a regular guy. I'm not I don't have a military background or law enforcement background. I'm just a regular guy who likes shooting, collecting guns. And so I don't I'm not some ace shot or some guy who can reload the magazine real fast or anything around <laughs> those lines. But but you know, I, I, I do enjoy them, and I, I think that this sort of gives people some better perspective as to how alike or, or unlike the uh, the guns are in game versus in real life. And what's the verdict as far as the ones that you have um, used and compared to the dice? Get it uh, pretty pretty well correct or? Uh, for, for the guns that I've used, yeah, they have. There's a few aesthetic differences in the guns, and, and I, you really can't hold that against them, especially if they have only only had access to a few of the guns. The rest they base it on airsoft or based on images on the Internet or things like that. So I'm not going to – that doesn't bother me that much, but what they did get right is is the mechanics. How does the gun reload? How does – how do you – how do you how do you charge the weapon? How do you aim – what kind of sights does it have? What – uh, what's the rate of fire? Things like that. In one of my videos, I end up do shooting a, a full auto AK-74, in this case a polished Tantal. And mechanically, it's identical to an AK-74M in game. And what's really cool about it is that the rate of fire is identical to it. They got it right. The, <laughs> now, the sounds are all going to be a bit different. Now, take in mind, I don't have a, you know, a really expensive recording studio that I can bring to the, to the firing range. Right, right. Um, nor is it easy to record gun sounds. It's actually a very difficult process because of, of the, the kind of pressure differences you get when mm -hmm. firing a weapon. Firing a gun is very loud. It's a, it's, it's a very visceral experience because you not just hear it, you feel it. It's almost like being at a rock concert. It's, it's just different <laughs> than watching it on DVD, that kind of thing. Right. Um, so there, my final verdict, they, they got it right mostly. Yeah. Now, some of the guns, they, there's no way they could be able to know they got it right or not. Some guns, like the MK3 uh, shotgun, there's only two or three in existence in the world right now. Totally. Right. And right. so, how do they get it right? There's, only, there's, probably, there's probably one in, in a museum in South Africa, one by, one by the guy who made it, and that's about it. Or the AK971 or A94, they only made you know, 50 to 60 of them, mm -hmm. total. And, and they never got outside Russia because they're just prototype guns. And yeah, you go to Wikipedia and say, "Oh, well, it's used by Russian special forces." as Well, don't read everything you believe on, <laughs> on Wikipedia because it is not out there. Because there are serious collectors in the United States who would gladly pay fifty, hundred thousand dollars for those guns, and they can't get them because there, there's not many of them. They're to the point where they're sort of in, only in museums and that kind of thing. So there's no way they would have been able to get those right in, in any sort of uh, uh, actual way relative to actually having a gun in hand. Right. But but we're not going to hold. I don't hold that against them. No, I mean, they're doing it, the best they can. Then. Yeah, they're doing the best they can. Yeah. What? And so that's. Go ahead. What do you think is the favorite gun that you have um, compared to, to a real life gun? As far as your favorite. Oh. <laughs> well, I, you know, I love full auto guns, and so the AK-74 uh, full auto comparison was by far the most fun. 
And generally, I, I'm a big fan of Kalashnikov rifles, and yeah. I think they've done a pretty good job at, at putting a lot of the Kalashnikov kind of rifles into the game. Uh, I'd like to see more, actually. Uh, I think they got them mostly right. And so I'm, I, I, I really enjoy shooting the AK-74 clones in real life, and so the AK-74 in, in games also pretty good as well. So they're, they're all fun. There's, it's, they, really, they really are all fun. So is, like is, there one, is there one weapon that you despise the most? In real life or in the game or both? <laughs> both. Uh, ooh, okay. Um, this is going to, I mean, a lot of people are going to hate me for saying this, but the, the AUG A3 is not that fun of a, a gun to shoot in game, and in real life, it's, I'm not a big fan of bullpups. And in part because I'm a left-handed shooter, and so you have to change the bolt around to get the fire the, the ejection port to work right. right. Because if you shoot left-handed with the regular ejection port, it'll eject right into your face. You mm -hmm. don't want that. But it's 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 sort of a bulky gun, and bullet pups aren't that fun. I don't think bullet pups are that fun to use. Now that's personal opinion. People can say, well, no, Dasgro, the bullet pups are used by a number of, of armed forces out there, and they all love them. And you're just wrong. You know, that, that's just my own personal preference here. I just don't like shooting them. So something like the LED-5A2 you wouldn't enjoy to shoot either? No, and, and, and if I could actually get an LED-5 in real life, I would. They are also super rare in the United States. They're, mm -hmm. they, we may see them in the next 15, 20 years when they start to retire them from the, um, the British Armed Forces, but Correct. They're, there's, there's only a handful in the United States. So I really can't speak to how I would like or dislike the LED-5 or the right. KHTLs and 2 or the QBZ-95, or any other sort of esoteric bullpups they have in-game. Cool. So if we go back to talking about armor in Battlefield 3, um, I, I assume you you don't have any comparison videos to real-life armor out there, do you? <laughs> no, I, 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 I'd like to. I'd like to, because there are a number of places um, in the U.S. and in Europe where you can go and get it, you know, drive a tank around for a certain amount of money. Now, you can't shoot anything out right. of it. But maybe I'll do an XPC, maybe I'll do a mortar, or maybe I'll do an RPG. Actually, that's one of the videos coming up is an RPG-7. So those kind of things I can do, but big things like uh, fighter aircraft or helicopters, a little more difficult, to yeah. say the least. I uh, won't be doing those anytime soon unless I can arrange something special. Maybe if I team up with, what, Mac from Future Weapons or something, I can he can... You know, tell me I'll you know, bring, me, bring along with me, we can fly with helicopters or something, but... but yeah, that's, I think the main portable weapons are probably the most lever go to. Yeah. <laughs> so if we we're going to talk a little bit about armor uh, in Battlefield 3, especially going forward into armor kill, um, there's been some issues with armor balance in the past. Um, you know, if you're talking about the typical rock, paper, scissors model that Battlefield has always employed where, you know, uh, tank beats uh, vehicles, whatever, jets beat, beat tanks. Um, I, th I think any kind of small issues with that may get amplified in Armored Kill, where it's all about armor, um, especially with with some of the, uh, what, what's it called, um, tank supremacy mode, um, those things could, it could get, uh, well, s small problems may become bigger problems, but um, what do you think the current state of this whole rock, paper, scissors model as far as armor, um, and I guess we'll count air and um, yeah, even RPGs, javelins, whatever that that whole circle with the tank sort of in the middle. How how's that in your opinion at the moment? Is it is it okay? Is there any glaring issues that need to be addressed? Um, we're assuming that there may be a small patch, I guess, before armor kill. They did that with close quarters. Um, they're updating the game already. They might as well. Um, are are you looking forward to any particular tweaks or hoping that something's going to change? Well, to answer your first question, overall, I think the Rocky versus dichotomy is, is pretty pretty good for right now. It's a little rough around the edges in a few aspects of it, but I think it's mostly there. It, for those that saw the purported patch notes that came out in the last week or so about what was going to be changed in the new Armored Hero expansion, one of the things that, that really piqued my interest was things like the, the Vodnik and tank turrets are going to now do a lot more damage to aircraft, which if you go back to Battlefield 2, Battlefield Vietnam, and Battlefield 942, being a good tank gunner, being in that gun, being in that turret, and then being able to lead and shoot down enemy aircraft as they come on by was a was a honed skill and an important skill. Because unlike in Battlefield 3, in in those past games, you could you if you could get 15, 20 shots into that, you could do 20, 30, 40 percent damage to those those air assets, which was huge. That sort of 
help offset a circumstance where, where the enemy team may have air superiority and or air supremacy, worse yet. Uh, that, those sort of things on sort of the edge, fringes on the edges is sort of what I'm looking forward to them changing. There's some bugs here and there, such as the, the, the M1 Abrams front armor glitch, which for those that don't know is a glitch where if you have a T90 and a, an M1 Abrams and the T90 fires uh, at the M1 Abrams front as it's traveling forward, it will do rear damage, which is not good. It's not supposed to act that way. And, and, the, and the DICE devs have mentioned this as a problem and something they're going to fix. So I hope they do fix that in the upcoming armored kill patch. Uh, 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 other things, maybe it's it's well, maybe we should change uh, a little bit with how the stingers operate or how the iglas operate relative to the uh, the air assets, or even perhaps change up how the the flares and ECM and other perks that the air assets have right now. When I speak with a number of folks who do helicopter, do jets a lot, they they sort of quibble over some of the issues behind those perk loadouts and how that that ECM is a lot more temperamental than it needs to be, or flares only work in certain situations, and they have to compensate for it by perhaps going low altitude to try to you know, kill, kill the, the lock-ons that way, those sort of things. Uh, in the end, it's all about that rock versus balance, trying to get it so that if there are hard counters versus other types of assets, and it's up to that team to best utilize those different types of assets in a way to get the advantage over the, the opponent. You don't want to have a situation where, uh, and, and I'll, I'll bring up, for instance, uh, in the move, in the game GoldenEye, 007 GoldenEye from N64, the golden gun was fully imbalanced. That's going way back. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it was something that everyone would use given, given the situation, and there was no hard counter to it. And you want to be able to have these hard counters in place within that dynamic so that when, so that, if if one person says, "Oh my gosh, the enemy team has so many tanks," I need to go out. I need to go anti tank. Mm -hmm. I need to go javelin, or I need to, or I need to go recon, go so flim to aid my javelin friends, or I need to put anti tank mines down, or if they're if we're being dominated by helicopters and jets, I need to go stingers. I want people. I want that dichotomy to be in place so that when people make those kind of decisions, it actually pays off for them. Right. It actually says, "Wow, I actually helped my team because I got. I chose not to just go medic again or go support again mm -hmm. and and go stinger and take that that uh, right. that aircraft down. Right now, stingers aren't that not as powerful as they they used to be as it currently stands. Mm -hmm. And so it's it, that's sort of what I that's my idealism. That's sort of the what I'd like to see in the future. And I think I think they continue to make change to that. It's not an easy process. Uh, clearly, if you look at Blizzard with StarCraft 2, they constantly modify and update the balance of the game because it's very difficult to do balance right. It takes a lot of time, a lot of data, and a, and a lot of effort. It does. It's constantly changing, too. Well, and every it time is. when you make a change in that whole chain of rock, paper, scissors, you make a change to one small aspect, it all has like this whole monopoly effect where... You know, you make a small tweak over here, and it has perhaps unintended consequences way over else somewhere. And that's that's happened in the past where they've made a change to some damage setting or whatnot, and and all of a sudden it's really created an imbalance somewhere else. And then usually they tweak it again in the next patch. So it's always ongoing. So let's talk about armor perks. Um, why do you think some of them are really good, and why do you think some of them are really really bad? Um, say reactive armor. Reactive armor is a great perk to have. But something like the heavy machine gun, it's not something that you really want equipped. Well, it's the, the question of perk loadouts is always sort of an interesting one. When you watch these uh, videos by a lot of other YouTube commentators, they'll talk about what's the best perk or weapon or accessory loadout for a given weapon. What's the best loadout for the LSAT? What's the worst loadout for the LSAT? And then they'll go into that kind of thing. I recently did a, I'm doing a, an ongoing series about tanking. And I talk about the perks, but I try not to talk about different perk loadouts over another because I don't want people getting thinking thinking about that within a limited scope of, oh, I, I should always use this kind of perk loadout. However, when you look at a, most of the scenarios out there, reactive armor is one that people always choose over other things. They almost always choose canister shot or guided missile over the light machine gun or heavy machine gun for the, in the instance of the main battle tank. Right. And for the third, they may either do uh, IR smoke or may they do thermals, but that's about it. Why is that? Well, perk loadouts at, at the core are about opportunity costs. If I do not, if I go canister and don't go heavy machine gun, what, what's the opportunity cost of me not going heavy machine gun? 
And so it's, oh, well, the head machine gun allows me to engage guys at much longer range. Okay, canister has maybe a little bit less range at best, but I can one-shot kill people. And so we start to talk about it, about it in those contrasts, we realize that there are some big imbalances in how the perks are constructed. Mm -hmm. if, if we were to, if, I don't know if DICE has access to this kind of data, but I'd love to see some statistics about what kind of perk loadouts people use in tanks. I'd find that very, very few people use lab machine gun, head machine gun. Very few people uh, utilize thermal camo. Very few people utilize maintenance or auto loader. Because right. why would you go maintenance when reactive armor essentially gives you a free pass on three shots from three different directions of your of your tank and it buys you time it takes what five seven seconds to, to reload an rpg7 if you're engaging one guy that's seven seconds of you to get out if you need to that's a whole lot better than oh i got hit and and then maybe if i don't get hit ever again for the next 20 30 seconds then it begins to auto repair that kind of opportunity cost is clear that reactive armor is a better option that's sort of why I hope that for future perks that they put in for the armor class and more generally the vehicle classes, that they take that into consideration. Maybe make the head machine gun more powerful, or maybe make the light machine gun more powerful at different in different scenarios. There's a very few number of scenarios where I can I can say that auto loader is a better option than reactive. Maybe if I am way way out in the middle of Operation Fire or in behind in the back lines of Operation Firestorm, and I want to pixel people, I want to fire them at, at 500 meters plus, and yeah, auto loader probably better because I just want to get a bunch of volume on them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the same would apply for, for the zoom optics. I don't see a 2x optics being that powerful versus having uh, thermal vision or having smoke uh, unless you're playing at really, really long distances, which there aren't that many maps. And maybe in the new map, what's that? Uh, better just, yeah. Is that the new map? Yes. That will be the maybe on the, in the, on the largest map that they'll have the ability to do that. And, and need that, but but right now it's not the case. It's I'm not happy about that. It's true, and I think I personally, I and mean, we play mostly on public servers, but I think one of the biggest changes was recently during a patch, the javelins were buffed, and all of a sudden it was almost a necessity to equip smoke. I used to always right. run with uh, thermal, because right. it was just a lot easier to pick out targets, particularly infantry. Um, yeah. And it was okay to take a javelin hit once in a while, but but now with basically Javelin disabling the tank, um, and smoke being very, very effective on the other hand too, because the reload time, I don't know what the actual numbers are, but it feels like, at least it feels for me when I'm shooting at a tank with Javelin, that um, the smoke reload time and the Javelin reload time are almost identical, so yeah. you can just yeah. sit there and pop smoke. And the Javelin example is a really good example that, you, that, that, that goes back to, to sort of the original topic of this conversation, which is what's going to change when Arbor Kill comes out and Tank Security comes out? Javelins are actually incredibly effective against vehicles. They really are, especially when used with multiple people. And so There's a, up you know, I, I, I play multiple 32 versus 32 uh, match events. I do both globalconflict.org and I also use uh, go to uh, 21st Century Warfare. 21st Century Warfare actually has a rule in their guidebook that says you can't use javelins, period. Now, why is that? But you can't use them at all. There's no scenario where you can use them. They're basically a banned weapon akin to the M320 a few months back or the M26 Dart. Hmm. Why? Because they know that in, in an organized match of 32 versus 32, if you have five or six people dedicated to Javelin and two or three guys running SOFLAM or mm -hmm. two or three guys on the CITV, it, will, it, 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 it makes the vehicles worthless yes, because it's right. just a constant stream, a constant stream of laser lock javelins doing double damage and even if you smoke it doesn't matter because they're, they're just going to keep on coming and keep on coming and you, you throw a support guy on there with a with a with a, an ammo pack and it shuts those vehicles down that's my fear with tank superiority is you're going to get a situation where people go like okay well there's no reason why i shouldn't go engineer because it's tank superiority and i'm going against a lot of tanks why, might as well go javelin. You'll have one guy who likes to go into recon, put a SOFLAM down. The rest of the guys are going to be in their tanks in the CITV position, laser locking them like crazy, and it's going to be a smoke fest. And all these missiles going everywhere. Yeah. And <laughs> and it's going it, to... It, I'm, I have a lot of fear over that. I really I think do. there's a real possibility that that could happen. Unless there are some tweaks made. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. But I, I think that... I think a lot of people that play in public servers are a lot smarter than, than some people may you know, give them credit for, and they're going to adapt to that kind of thing. 
They're, well, the people are very, very fast learners when, when they're losing, and they will find, oh, let's just go crazy amounts of javelins. And it's, that, may be, that may not be as, as satisfying as an experience that dice would like us to have. Yeah, that is, that's true. And what's interesting is Armor Kill is also going to come with a couple of new armor perks, I, I believe. Um, 20 of them. Yeah, I, that would be, I guess, stretched across the different classes of like the IFV and whatnot. But um, we don't know what they are, but maybe we can sort of guesstimate or, or have some kind of discussion about what we think it might be, what might make sense, given the scenario that we just talked about with a lot of javelins and so forth. Maybe there's some new perks that can counter that. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Either one of you, really. Um, I, I, I think what would be interesting is if there was something, some alternative to smoke that, and I don't know what that would be, but that would somehow mitigate the power of Soflam and, and Javelins. Because Soflam is also very difficult to take out for a tanker, I, I yeah, a lot of times, especially if they're far away, they seem to have quite the range. Usually, somebody puts them up on a crane somewhere, <laughs> you know, in some some ridiculous position. But um, yeah, it'd be interesting. I'm not sure what uh, what kind of perks they could introduce, and that goes both for the the main battle tanks as well as secondary perks. Like you talked about the um, light machine gun, heavy machine gun, you know. So, I I mean, if I could think of a few perks, it maybe it's uh, maybe it's uh, like an active protection system, an APS, when back in several years ago, there was a number of uh, R&D projects in the defense industry and in the military trying to create this sort of system where a the tank would, would, it would detect an incoming uh, missile or projectile coming at it, and it would actually send a counter-missile. The counter-missile would basically be mm. launched or like smoke and, and either net the, the missile or blow up the missile before it hits or things like that. And it would still do some damage, but it wouldn't do, it wouldn't penetrate that armor. So maybe it's something like that where maybe it, it goes off and then it resets every so many seconds. It does a little bit of damage to you, but doesn't doesn't do as much damage as, as you uh, would expect it to. Maybe something around those lines or perhaps... Uh, different types of ammunition beyond mm. what we currently see right now with the main gun you got a guided shell and you got and you and you have your, your your main your your main shell maybe you could switch it up so you have one that's even that's sort of more of a mix towards uh, uh, towards anti infantry but not in the same way the canister sh uh, shell is canister shell is sort of like a rail gun it doesn't actually have that much spread even though that it's supposed to be a shotgun uh, shell mm -hmm. maybe a sign that that launches a grenade or I mean like a grenade launcher in in the, in the quake series or or is really good at clearing out a, 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 a enclosed space like a building or something around those lines or maybe have a shell that's dedicated just for uh, anti tank and so if you don't get a, a body shot on a person then it doesn't kill them. It doesn't do splash damage like the, the current shells do as, as it stands. Right. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, those sort of things would be you know kind of neat to, to see. And maybe even to your to your example, all it, maybe it's a electronic countermeasure for the tanks. They do exist in real life, and it'd be really cool to see them as well. Where you sort of have these countermeasures that that come up and and are able to to to, to stop or distract the the vehicles, that kind of thing. Yeah, I could I could see the grenades because I mean they have that in the uh, amphibious. APCs, they have those grenade launchers that sort of fire a salvo of three grenades or whatever, and so that might work. It'd be interesting if they all have any kind of specific countermeasures against air, or perhaps mm -hmm. even offensive weapons against air. I know right now that if you have jets flying around, I mean, you can kind of use a guided shell. A lot of people use the canister shell against helicopters. It's fairly effective. Um, some people are just really good at using the main shell against helicopters, but it would be yeah. interesting if there might be some um, extra weapons, perhaps even something for the... Th the, th the th um, third seat instead of just a CITV that might be yeah an interesting idea as well. even even something like this would be kind of a goofy example but if you look at how some of the the uh, armed forces nowadays do uh, countermine activities where there's a but there's a big minefield and they want to create a path through it they launch this big ribbon full of C4 explosives right. and it launches it you know 100 150 meters and then it lands and then it all blows up in this big line. I think that'd be awesome to have that kind of ability. And you're playing on a on a on a uh, I don't know a, a map like uh, Operation Firestorm, and you blow it up, and suddenly there's this big you know line of destruction through the buildings and through the through everything, and, and it just <laughs> kind of creates this different dynamic. That'd be really cool to do. 
And I, those kind of things would be really neat. And I, I, don't, I think it would be within the realm of possibility, albeit it's a bit of an exaggeration, but I think it would still be cool to, to see as well. That would be pretty cool. Uh, what do you think about the, uh, the new tank killers that are coming out? They're kind of like the, uh, the APCs with the tank turrets on top. Oh, I, 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 I don't know how I feel about those. And here's, <laughs> here's why. Right. right now, right now, a lot of people have this misconception that people that aren't in the, don't play vehicles that much, that, okay, a main battle tank is clearly going to be better than an infantry fighting vehicle, and the infantry fighting vehicles are clearly going to be better than the Vodniks or the, the Humvees, what have you. Right now, as it currently stands, if you take the best perk loadout for the main battle tank versus the best perk loadout of, a, of an IFV, the IFV is going to win every time. And the reason why is that the IFV's main gun, the IFV's AP shells, go through the reactive armor of the tank. It doesn't, it doesn't blow, it, blow it up, it just goes through it. And so it's almost like the shield isn't even there. Because of that, and the reload times, and the fact that these shells don't do differenti differentiating damage based on angle of attack, you can very quickly kill a, a tank with an IFV, while you as an IFV have, have, ar have your reactive armor on all four sides. And so that, sh that tank will maybe get two or three volleys on you, which is 12 to 15 seconds at the most. And during that same period of time, you're going to be able to kill that tank and get it disabled easily. That, right now, is a huge problem. And I have some fear with this because in armor kill trailers, we've seen that, the, that these new tank killers are using the tow missile, you know, the missile that you can guide, sort of wire guided mm -hmm. as you move your turret back and forth. That's a perk that only the IFVs have right now. The, the tanks yeah. don't have that, which leads me to believe that, that they'll also have all the other perks, such as the AP rounds. And the AP rounds, uh, if, they, if they have those plus a main battle tank gun, that's scary stuff. Because the IFVs have huge advantages over maneuverability. They can go a whole lot faster and accelerate faster than the tanks can, and, uh, and they can carry more people. Then they don't have a CITV turret, which is, which is an advantage that it was in the tanks camp, but I, I have some real reservations about how they're, how they're going to do these tank killers and or change the IFVs, because right now it's pretty heavily imbalanced as it is between, you know, between that and tanks. Yeah, it comes down again to the rock, paper, scissors model and, and seeing how they can fit a new element into that current circle that we have happening there and, and, and see how that balances out. Um, looking forward to that though, it's going to be, I think, probably more interesting to me than new perks to existing vehicles is just having this sort of new class of vehicle altogether. I know it's a bit of a mishmash between an IFV and a tank, but it, it, it will be interesting and I, I don't know, I've seen, in the trailers I've seen tanks go down quite quickly. There's been a lot yeah. of, you know, drive in, destroy, and then you get blown up by something else and do it all over again. So I wonder if there's going to be a lot of the rush in, blow up a tank or two, get killed, do it all over again as opposed to, um, you know, sort of driving the tank around for a few minutes at a time and actually being able to play without being interrupted. But that's going to be interesting. How do you think tank superiority mode is going to play out? Especially we're talking large maps, a lot of armor, and 64 players I, I can see that happen. But I always wonder, and this is where I sort of feel for the guys on the consoles um, that are limited to 24 players, so 12 aside, how do you think that's going to work out for, for them with less players, larger maps, lots of armor? They actually may find it a lot more enjoyable than the PC folks, only because there's not going to be as many guys on the ground with javelins. And as mm -hmm. such, it's going to be much more of a tank-on-tank -tank experience with a few engineers here and there repairing and, and, and throwing javelins and RPGs. But, but the, the PC guys, with all those extra people, because I, I don't believe they're going to have extra tanks on the PC Conquest large ver versions, or whatever it may be. They do have a lot more where, where it can accommodate 32 people on each side than, than, than perhaps my, uh, my concerns are unfounded. But I, I do have, I still think that it may be a problem. I, console guys may have it better in this respect. We'll see. That's true. Uh, what, how do you feel about the, um, the new artillery systems coming with these, these new uh, artillery vehicles? Do you think that they're actually going to be a, uh, a viable option for players to use, or do you think it's going to be something like the IED bot or <laughs> something to use like the mortar, where it just looks really cool, but it's not going to be useful at all? Well, I'm really looking forward to the rock artillery. I think that I sort of harken back to the old Battlefield 942 days where right. you had these artillery pieces that you could roll around and you could shoot. Now, they weren't nearly as effective in, the, in Battlefield 942, 
uh, as as you think they would be because you had to be pretty good at, at utilizing them. They had really big explo uh, uh, blast radiuses for their mm -hmm. for when they fired, which was really really cool. But they were difficult to use unless you had a spotter helping you out. It was basically a line of sight gun. Now in Battlefield Two, we had the the, the commander artillery, which was also yep. really awesome. Uh, but again, it was limited just to one guy, just the commander. And if you had a guy in your public server who was a bad commander, yeah. Yeah, what was he doing? He wasn't artillery, the guys. He was dropping jeeps on them. He was dropping jeeps on <laughs> them. Supply crates. Or dropping supply crates on them and getting supply <laughs> crate kills. Yeah. I mean, oh, I, I, you know, people always say, hey, you know, we should put commander mode back in Battlefield 3. And I was like, you know, they'll, they'll do it and they'll pay it, create a series of, 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 uh, of unlocks or medals along with that. And, you know, it'll be one, it'll be one that says, says, get five kills with a supply crate. And then, and then it'll just be, and then the supply crates aren't helping your friends. Your teammates, they're being dropped on your enemies. And if supply crates are anything like, they, like the, the health and ammo packs in this game are, it actually helped the enemy because it would heal them and repair them and other things around those lines. That's, I don't know how I feel about that. But, but to the to armored kill, the HIMAR systems and the, what was the other one called? The club, not the club, the Grum missile, whatever it's called. Those, I think from the trailer from what I've seen, it, it'll be a lot more similar to Battle 4 942. Uh, with probably as much range, with a whole lot more destruction, almost like the Katusha rockets about from 942 on the Soviet Union side. Right. I want to see that. I want to see just this constant rain of fire where it just destroys not just one tank, but a bunch of tanks that are in the, kind of within the cap radius of a given area. If, if it does that, it can do it at longer ranges, and it's, it's pretty intuitive, and it's not difficult for people to use. I think it's going to be a huge success. People are going to use them like crazy. But if they don't have, if it's basically like the a bunch of, Let's, let's pretend for a moment that does as much damage as one volley of the Amtrak's grenades and it doesn't reload within three or four seconds. It takes maybe 15, 20 seconds to reload. That mm -hmm. makes it a, a, a worthless asset because you're not doing a bunch of damage all at once. You're giving the enemy freedom of, of, of in time to, to make changes that get away from where you're hitting, things like that. It's it, it would be no more effective than how the mortar is right now, which really isn't as effective as it should be. That's that's my that's what I feel about that. You, do you think they're going to use the uh, mobile artillery system as more of a infantry suppression type system, or do you think it's going to be used more as a anti armor? I don't know. I mean, I mean, the HIMARS system as a as a weapon system has a lot of different payload options right. in real life that you could utilize, but. Right. It depends on how they how how deep they want to go into it. They just want to have one kind of missile that does a bunch of damage to infantry and uh, tanks. Just in if you look at the rocket artillery in Battlefield 42, it did it did a lot of damage both tank and infantry. If you got if you got a direct hit on a tank with one of those rockets, it basically did 50 to 75 damage, which is a lot. Whereas if you're an infantry and you are within that blast radius when they land, you're 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 basically getting your life taken up in in, in thirty percent increments. It's re, it was really really damaging. So I hope it's if they don't want to go full out on different types of of loadouts in terms of the missiles, whether you want an anti tank missile versus a an anti infantry missile, an air you know sort of a cluster munitions versus something more precision. Then maybe sort of a a, a middle good middle ground would be what we saw in those past games. All right. Well, hopefully we'll see you know perks and loadouts for these systems like we have for the other armors. You bring up an interesting point. You mentioned 1942 and sort of the reference to artillery systems there. Um, I've heard from a few people that from the looks of it, the artillery, the rocket artillery in Armored Kill is just going to be fired from the position of the gunner, similar to the mortar. Um, whereas people have mentioned 1942, you had this option of having spotters that could sort of coordinate where you're going to do that. Um, what are your thoughts on the absence of that feature do you think it would have brought in some value maybe and you know we talk about those 64 players and a bunch of them not having certain tasks to do i think maybe it would have brought in some extra roles that people can play to help the team i i think it would be fantastic if they were doing something similar to that now in battlefront 42 it just gave you a side picture you still had to to basically uh um zero in on that given target. And so you'd fire into the air, and then you would see your shell go through the air and land <laughs> 500 meters in the wrong direction. You'd go, okay, I got I to gotta shoot accordingly. Maybe make it easier. Maybe make it so the recon has a 
a SOFLAM. The SOFLAM can lock on to any target, not just laser lock on something, but it can basically do sort of an area lock on. Mm -hmm. And then once it, it gives that lock on, the high Mars guys can jump on their, you know, in, in the gunner position. And it's, it basically have two little arrows and be like, almost like a little puzzle game, similar to what we see in games like Bioshock, where it's line up the lines to where these dots are and you'll hit the target. <laughs> right. and you, you know, and you make it a mini game. And, and you fire, and it does damage where the guy locked on. That would be awesome. Or maybe it's a laser lock on, you, and then you can have like a precision guided mode on the high mars where you launch it, and it just laser locks it and hits that target without you even having to aim. Those kind of things w w would diversify the kind of options you have a high mars, make teamwork more important. And uh, I think those would be really cool things to do. Yeah. I think the recon, I mean, I'm generally speaking, I, I think the recon class isn't used that much because it's not that good of a class. And I know that's going to make a lot of people angry, but it's not that viable of a class relative, again, to the opportunity cost of not choosing our class. Yeah, and if and, you think about it, people are, in the end, um, trying to get points, unless it's maybe in competitive play, but certainly in public servers, a lot of people are trying to get points. And as powerful and helpful as the SOFLAM is to a team, you get relatively low rewards for putting that up there and having yeah. your team be able to pick up tanks everywhere. And that is a question of the incentive systems in place. I would love to see recon and support classes get a whole lot more points relative to the medic classes to encourage people to utilize and utilize good tactics. So Flam is a pretty or powerful asset if used correctly. Same with MAV, same with tugs. And it's, it's very difficult to, to uh, utilize those sort of assets when, for instance, most of the recon-only guns are more tailored for long-distance shooting. And so how, how do you, are you, is Dice suggesting that they simply put a, a, a tugs uh, near the battle and then run 100 meters in the opposite direction? <laughs> That's, there's a time equation to all these to all this point structure. And you don't want people spending 30, 40 seconds running to a position where they won't get wrecked because they have a gun that's designed only for long distance, yet try to get points and try to be con contribute to their team by having a tug to a certain position. That to me, that's a disconnect, and I would love and I'd love to see uh, you know, changes made in that respect, and more generally make some of these recon assets more powerful. More powerful is not even the right word; it's more effective. Make them more viable, so that when you put it down, you know that you've contributed to your team, mm -hmm. and it's gonna it's gonna be helpful and. That that's that kind of stuff. So flam, the so flam high mars thing that I just described would be a great way of doing it. Mm -hmm. That that's sort of what I'd like to see. I want to see this rock paper scissors dynamic, not just in vehicles versus infantry. I want to see it between the classes as well. Not having viable classes, and I bet if if with battle log, if they did some basic stats, they'd find that most people don't do recon or support class. Most people are playing. Most of the guys that are playing hours and hours and hours are doing medic or engineer, and it's yeah. really unfortunate. It's almost like. Going back to, to StarCraft 2, be like if everyone plays Terran, no one plays Zerg, and no one plays Protoss, because Terran is so much more viable of a of a of a race to play relative to all the other ones that everyone abandons it. But mix those guys that like playing Zerg or Battlefield Zero like playing Recon, it 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 marginalizes them, and that's yeah. a terrible thing that you want to do to your community is marginalize a portion of them because uh, you're just putting in for a gimmick that's really not that good. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I want it to be more viable. Yeah, I agree with that. It does definitely, and I think you're right about those stats. I think if you were to look at that, most people will choose medic if it's an infantry kind of map, engineer if it's any kind of vehicle armor based map, and, and I think that definitely is a good point. Um, the the other new thing we're going to have in armored kill, of course, is the AC-130. A lot of ha has been made about that, uh, a huge powerful gunship that is on rail, so you can't really control where it goes. Um, there's still a lot of questions, I think, about how difficult is it going to be to take it down? How powerful is it? How does it factor into the whole rock, paper, scissors equation? Because, again, um, it's going to have a big influence on armor, on infantry on the ground. Um, you control it for your team by controlling a certain flag position in the Conquest maps. Um, how do you think it's going to be perceived and... How do you think it's going to factor into the equation as far as balance relating to other armor and infantry on the map? Well, like the issue behind the tank killers, I, I, I have some concerns about the, a, the AC-130 as it relates to being on a rail system. I don't have an issue, generally speaking, with it being on a rail system, but the issue is, is that if you watch some of these videos that are playing now you know, for my footage or on my channel, 
good or even you know decent to above average tank drivers can, can take their vehicles. They can take down helicopters, especially if they're low on the ground. They can take down jets if they're you know you know flying low and slow. It's not that hard to get those kind of hits once you get a feel for how the main battle tank fires. Same thing goes with IFV to a lesser extent. My fear is is that with an AC-130 on rails, it means that it is it has a predictable movement from one point of the map to the next. And so there, the, I, I, it, it, I, I would not be surprised that at least on one of the maps, there's a, a, a position where you can, can take that tank and drive it into a hill and get that high angle of attack and then just start slamming shells into that AC-130. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, 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 I've heard rumors or seen rumors rather that have said, hey, the, uh, the AC-130, if slammed, if slammed into with an enemy jet, will only take 20 damage, 20 percent damage, or 30 percent damage, whatever it may be. Okay, that's fine. That may also mean that it could take one or two or three more tank shells. But still, you have one or two tank guys that know how to get on these high inclines can, and, and can take out the AC-130. It takes, what? It takes 20 seconds to fire five shells. If you can get all five of those shots, and we know that it's going to be easy because it's going slow and it's going on a predictable path at the same elevation, you may that, that may ruin a lot of people's fun because there's going to be one guy who knows how to do that. Or worse yet, anti-tank guys, engineer guys that can do the same thing with their RPG-7. Yeah. Again, it's, I mean, it's it, 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 once you get the feel for the timing and things like that, it, yeah. it's not that hard to do, and that's my big fear out of it. It's not the jets ramming into it. It's the it's the tank guys now you could say well hey ac-130 can just blow up those tanks is there a high angle attack yeah maybe i i we'll we'll see but that to me that is a big concern i hope they figure out some way to, to mitigate that or or something else around those lines that's yeah. that's you know, my take on it i think that is a good I, point um that that could get a little bit too predictable perhaps but i i guess we'll see that, that's one of those it's things like, that may take a little bit of time for people to figure out as well. And, you know, two weeks from now, there may be people who are aware of that. Three weeks from now, everybody's aware of it. Four weeks from now, something gets changed that, uh, you know, mitigates that again. So, It's almost like um, in, in the Call of Duty uh, franchise with public, ser with public servers. You get a few guys that know at the start of the round, if they can go for a certain kill streak, that they can get a certain number of kill streak rewards, and it just it just multiplies itself, and that has and, and that and while that kind of kill streak stuff is fun for some people, it's actually a lot, not not a lot of fun for a lot of other people because then they'll get like a five, seven, ten kill streak, whatever it is, and then the helicopter comes and just mows people down mm -hmm. and destroys all their kill streaks. Right. Well, then the you know, AC one thirty comes, oh, it's showing us and what have you. That you know, that's a sort of a game mechanic that has negative repercussions or even unintended consequences that may disenfranchise some people. Now, they're still putting that in Call of Duty, so maybe you know, the amount of people that like it far outweigh those that don't, but you sort of get the idea of what I'm talking about. Right. How do you think with the, uh, the amount of vehicles, um, the amount of vehicles that are going to be on these, these new large maps in Armored Kill, do you think it's going to make people want to play more as a team, or do you think we're going to have somewhat of what we see right now, these uh, lone wolf kind of um, armor operators. Well, I, I, would, I would hate to, and I'll just, I'll let you answer that in a second, but I just one yeah. comment about that is, I would hate to see what we see on a lot of maps now, where at the start of the round, you know, there's three tanks parked there, and everyone takes off with a single person in the tank, and then there's eight people <laughs> jumping around waiting for the next, you know, for them to get killed just a little bit down the road. That would suck. <laughs> and, and I think that you're probably right. I don't think it's going to change. There's... <laughs> Because it was, I mean, it's two parts. One, people are impatient when they get in the vehicle. They want, they know that, oh man, I gotta get in this vehicle. I gotta drive thirty seconds to the battle, whereas I could just spawn at the spawn point near the battle and just ran ten seconds. So that's one factor. Out. And the second factor is, is that you may not even have someone who's interested in being with you, being with you in the tank, being a gunner or being a CITV, or let alone someone who's an engineer or someone who's running the right perk loadout so you get to stack proximity or maintenance or what have you. That I don't see it that often in pubs. Now, granted, I don't pub a ton, but I don't see it as often as I'd like to see it, and that may discourage people. Now, maybe with all the tanks available or with people knowing that they're going into a game where everyone's tanking, that perhaps will give people a bit more motivation to work together as a team because they know that if they don't keep the tanks up, they're going to lose quickly and badly. Almost right. like if you, don't, if you don't play 
you know, certain types of classes or utilize smoke, for instance, on Operation Metro, and you don't get that B point at the start, you're basically screwed. Right. For the most part. Yep. I mean, right. and, and, and people are slowly realizing with Metro, for instance, that you get two or three guys who know how to use smoke and know how to push the back escalator. They're going to be able to get that flank and push on A if they're on uh, U.S. side and get the win on that. But, again, it's a slow process. And mm -hmm. it, I, that, I, I think that, that oh, you are, you're, you're probably more right than what I'd like you to be in terms of <laughs> I, 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 don't know, I, I'm, I have concerns. Yeah. That's but, again, if they, if, they change, if they change the incentive structure – so that if you are a tank gunner, you get a whole bunch more points. Yeah. Or, or if you are a tank driver, you get double points for having a CITV guy in there. You get triple points to get a CTV and a gunner. They do that yeah. kind of thing. That's going to incentivize people to stop and wait 15 seconds because they get triple points. Those kind of things are not hard to implement. It's, we're not talking about you know, big changes in the game. This is just changing multipliers, those kind of things. That, I think that would be really cool. That would be one way you can do it. Um, now, going forward, when we're talking about, we sort of know what we're going to get in Armored Kill as far as new vehicles. Um, we're not going to see any new weapons in there, but um, thinking of the future of Battle for 3, the next couple of expansion packs, what would you like to see um, going forward, whether it be new equipment, uh, new vehicles, new weapons, um, anything in particular? Is there any items that are currently underused you'd like to see more of. Uh, one of the things I'm thinking of in particular that you had mentioned was actually the A-10 and the Frogfoot, um, which are jets that you, if you play Conquest, and I'll admit this, I'm a big Conquest player. I'm back from the Battlefield 2 days. I play relatively little rush mode, so I have probably a combined three minutes in those two vehicles. Um, yeah. So that they're fairly underused. I'd love to see them on, especially the armor kill mode, because that's what they're made for. So. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I'd love to see the A-10 and Frogfoot be utilized. I, you look at, at, at older Battlefield games, like Battlefield uh, 942 or Battlefield Vietnam, you, you see multiple di you different types of air vehicles. In 942, you had, you had, a, you had a, a B-17. You had a bomber. It wouldn't drop one bomb. It'd drop a bunch of bombs in, 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 in a strafing run. That's cool stuff. That'd be cool to have that kind of thing. The closest thing we can get to is an A-10 or, or a Frogfoot, and that'd be an easy thing to incorporate. You, you, you make the, the sides play so that you have air, air sets that are really good at anti-tank uh, and anti-infantry, and you have air, set, air sets that are really good at anti-air. To me, I think it's a, a no-brainer, real easy to incorporate. Now, there, there may be dynamics well beyond the scope of my understanding that, that play into this, but that's an easy thing to do. To, to add those kind of things in there. Or maybe it's, I don't know, adding in older uh, Battlefield era vehicles. Adding in, for instance, uh, a Humvee with a tow launcher. Or, yeah. or maybe some of the Battlefield 942 era uh, tanks. And I know that's kind of goofy, because clearly a, an Abrams would, would, would be able to easily take out a T-34 or a, or a Sherman. But you know, adding that kind of thing would be kind of cool. We we saw that in in Bad Company too when they put in the Thompson, they put in mm -hmm. the 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 Garand, and they put in the the 1911. That's I think it'd be really cool to to add back in. Maybe make it only you know make it only make it Wake Island only or something around those lines. Put another one of those maps into play. Uh, you know, beyond those kind of things, I uh, it's there's not much else that I would add without fundamentally changing the gameplay as a whole. I mean, I one of the things that that has that sort of made me distraught in playing these newer Battlefield games in the last few years is the the absence of naval units. I want battleships. Right. I want carriers. Yeah. They were so much fun to utilize. I want submarines. I want I want a battleship as 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 bigger than a cap point, you know, it's a gigantic thing, with a bunch of a bunch of what, those old eighteen inch guns and just blowing things up. I love <laughs> that idea. I know in modern day battleships are kind of long gone. Maybe you you do a destroyer with some cruise missiles, a Tomahawk cruise missile, or with or with some anti ship missiles. What was this the is, what was the map that took place entirely on a carrier? Was that a, a special forces uh, map? Uh, that was uh, that was Iron Gator. Yeah. Yes. Also for Battlefield 942, it was Coral Sea, which was two carriers against each other. Mm -hmm. uh, all fun stuff. But and now and, and those kind of Gimmick maps aren't nearly as there as I'd like it to be because in 
and, and and this is in Battlefield Two. You had maps like like Gator. You had you had maps uh, that were basically all armor maps. You had map, maps that were in Battlefield Two, like uh, Battle of Britain, Coral Sea. They were all air maps. There were just half a dozen to a dozen jets all flying around. And anyone get into it? You know, in this case, they were they were fighter aircraft. They weren't jets. And they were, and it's just these epic you know dogfighting battles. So, mm-hmm. Something like like out of Top Gun, but with a bunch more. And, and you got a few guys manning anti-aircraft uh, guns at the bottom. That was cool stuff. Or you look at at, uh, at at Operation Aberdeen, which was a a another map they put up in Battle Royale 2 that was, what, eight tanks per side? And it was just big open desert, hilly desert, and a few cap points. That was, those kind of maps are a lot of fun. And they, they speak to certain portions of the community that play. Metro clearly is an example in Battlefield 3 because it's an all-infantry you know, cluster of a map. It's just... There's there's no vehicles. There's there's no open terrain. It's just two lanes pushing each other like crazy. Hopefully, in in Armored Kill and in future expansion packs, they continue to expand upon those maps so that you have those kinds of of niche maps that allow people to continue to experience Battlefield in their own way. Uh, if, if anybody in the chat room has got some questions for Dasko, I know one of the questions asked earlier was um, <laughs> it's a very broad question, but uh, what would you make better what would you improve in battlefield 3 and it's it's a huge question but is there one particular item one particular issue that bothers you the most if if if, of the the things that would be the most easiest thing to change it would be what i talked about what 20 30 minutes ago about the, the class balancing yeah i really don't like the fact that recon support classes are are not as valuable as other classes and let me give you another example as an engineer, uh, engineer class, engineer class is, is pretty good against anti-tank right now. But its its main weapon, its rifle, like a, it's a, a they guess it for you and for a one those kind of things. They're only slightly worse, slightly worse than the assault guns. So okay, I I, I don't get my revives and I don't get my med packs, but I I still can take out tanks and I'm nearly as good as infantry regardless. To me that. When I think of anti-tank classes, I think of classes that are making the conscious choice of, of being very good against armor, but being not nearly as good against infantry. And I see that I don't see that being the case in Battlefield 3. And that that's just one of many examples of of the class dynamics not being aligned. I, it needs to be more balanced, and maybe it's it's making things more effective. Maybe it's slightly reducing damages in some areas, increasing damage in other areas. Uh, making perks more viable. Mm-hmm. I mean, IED bot, as you mentioned, not that viable. No. Sort of a yeah. sort of a neat perk, and I'd love it to be more viable. I don't know how you do it. Maybe you make it more resilient. Maybe you make it super fast. Maybe you. It's just I easier don't. to control. Like right now, it's just it's difficult just to get it to move around and get it to go where you where you want it to go. I think most of the time when you see it out there, it's somebody trying to kill somebody with it for that one particular assignment. Yeah. That's all I see people do with it. And I, I that. To me, that's so. I mean, I, I remember watching Battlefield Three trailer before the game came out. I remember that one time where you see everyone's fighting and stuff, and then you see sort of this comedic moment of the IED running into the, the the barricade, and everyone laughs. But alas, it's not it's not viable. It's not good. You know, no one's using it. I mean, I it, I it, it's really quite sad. I mean, mortar is in is in the same category in that respect. Mortar isn't nearly as good as it could be, and. And again, there's some dynamics beyond just talking about something that's good versus bad. The viability of it as a as a asset is going to vastly differ depending on what kind of map you're playing or game mode you're playing. And so I'm not seeing this as an easy fix because the mortar viability is a whole lot different on Rush than it is on on Conquest. Or those kind of things have to be considered. And it's not an easy decision to make, easy way to change it because you have different game modes, you have different play styles, and you have different sizes of maps and types of maps, and it, so it, it 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 it's not something that I'm I'm laying blame on dice for because it's it's not an easy thing to fix, right? To take anything into consideration. Well, and they sort of had the mortar in the beginning. It, it was it used to be more powerful than it is now, and I, I think then it it was changed. So um, it it all depends. It is very difficult to to get that balanced right. Um, Question from PTO Assassin. One of the, one of the ones was should they buff the EOD bot or the mortar, which kind of you just 
mention on and, and whether it's a buff or a change or some kind of you know dif difference maker uh, uh, it's, the other question though is should the recon class have something to effectively destroy tanks and I'm thinking back this used to be in one of the bad company games I think the recon class had not just a laser pointer in the sense of a sofa but also the ability to then actually call in a missile on that I don't know if that's um, I don't I don't I don't see anything wrong with that I mean I it's I really don't. I mean, what if it was something like this? So back in a few years ago, the U.S. Army was developing a program called uh, Inlos LS, uh, and the nickname was Missile in a Box. And here's what it was: it was basically a a uh, a, a a container, like a, almost like a pouted container that had what was this? 15 missiles, and you just drop it into the theater, the the the. the the enemy battle space, and then you could call on demand using a SOFLAM or something similar to it, a missile that would launch from the base. It would be really cool if the engineer class had something like that, where they could like build uh, the <laughs> missiles in a box. They could leave it be, and the recon class could use it to their heart's content. That would be cool stuff. That's yeah. something that would be. Wouldn't, I mean, that would that would allow the recon class to do that. Or what if you give them? Um, the, there, there are these types of explosives out there that you they saw in Iraq a few years ago. They're they're called. Uh, RKG sevens. They're basically these. They look like old, uh, old stick grenades that the Germans used to use in World War II. And you basically pull the trigger. You th you throw it in the air uh, uh, underhanded. And then once it throws into the air, after a parachute deploys. And then it it actually shoots a shape charge into whatever direction it's pointing at. You know, and it's meant to basically be a close quarter tank killer. You throw this thing in the air, a parachute deploys, and then it shoots a shape charge warhead directly into that armor, penetrating it and doing damage to it. That'd be kind of a cool thing to do either for the engineering class or recon class. Mm -hmm. But that's, but again, not not Battlefield Three right now, and but it'd be really cool to see those kind of things. So that's, I mean, beyond that, how do you how do you make recon more viable? I don't know. I think other than the incentive system on the points, which doesn't really answer the question of for those that are really into the super competitive side, how. How do you how do you make that more viable, especially in the smaller gameplay? I don't know, but for the pub play, you could. There's ways you, I think you could do it. Yeah, and there's certainly we've talked about this in the past. Some points, if you do enjoy playing as a recon sniper, um, just something simple as playing in hardcore mode will probably give you a little more joy um, being a sniper, just because one shot kills. So uh, I don't know. I find that I I don't play recon sniper very often, but when I do, I find I have more enjoyment doing it in hardcore mode because it's a little bit easier and there's nothing more frustrating than getting a, a decent shot on somebody in normal mode just to have them then run away and you know you, yeah I don't know you wanna you wanna have or they turn around and kill you yeah well that would be worse with their shotgun from 300 yards away I, that, mm -hmm. that's happened but um, if there's no other questions in the chat and I don't know if maybe the recording time wasn't so good it's right around dinner time for a lot of people but <laughs> I want to thank you, Dasgro, for coming on the show because I think it was very interesting um, hearing you talk about all the uh, not just the real life weapons, but also your opinions on armor and armor kill going forward. Um, tell people where they can find you online. Okay, well, you can find me on youtube.com forward slash Dasgro. You can find me on uh, Twitch TV Dasgro or user Dasgro. I forget how that nomenclature goes. Uh, you can find me on Twitter Dasgro. You can find me on Facebook Dasgro. It's all Dasgro. Well, actually, I've got a question. What's Where that? did Dasgo come from? Uh, I I had I just made up the name because I had uh, oh okay back in Command and Conquer Red Alert there was a class uh, that the that the Iraqis used called the Desolator. Desolator was a chemical warfare guy who basically contaminate the ground with radiation stuff. This is before the invasion of Iraq, so it kind of made it funny. <laughs> but but uh, but that was sort of the, you know, the thing. And I, I, I like using that character, and I was like, well, I don't want to call me called Desolator. And I, I just said, oh, let's just throw some other characters in there. Went from there. And it just so happens, several years later, that there actually is another guy named Dasko out there. He's a French rapper. And so every so often on, on, uh, on YouTube or on, uh, or on Twitter, I get some of his French fans that send me messages thinking that I <laughs> am this rapper named Dasko. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's weird. And... I haven't talked to the guy. I have more subscribers than he does on YouTube, so I guess that's good. But uh, that's I don't I didn't yeah, I didn't see that coming from my way. <laughs> there is actually one other question. Sorry that I I missed that earlier, and it relates to two other things. Is um, would you like to see more night maps, and then in more general, what type of maps would you like to see more of? I guess it also leads into 
what are your preferred maps out of the maps we currently have? <sighs> well, night maps I'd like to see more of, yes. I'd like to see more maps that have uh, have weather. I mean, old older versions of Grand Bazaar had a lot more weather than what they have now. You know, like actual heavy rain, that kind of thing. And in that respect, I'd like to see different perk loadouts be better in those maps. Night vision, uh, you know, everyone was using night vision mm -hmm. a few months ago because it was so easy to kill people with. And now no one uses it because there's only one night map in Tehran and it doesn't actually give you that much of an advantage. It really doesn't because you can play around with your settings enough that it doesn't really look like a night, a night map. I'd like to see a real night map where night vision actually is critical and be able to use it. That, to me, that, may, that makes it a whole, lot, a whole lot more interesting in that respect. Mm -hmm. or, or maybe, in addition to that, you, on, a, on a map that's raining, you make the vehicles more sluggish to, to drive in when you're driving over pavement versus, yeah, or you get them stuck. That's a, I mean, that would annoy a lot of people. I think it would be a really cool idea to have, to add in that kind of thing. Now, maybe I'm describing something that, that won't be available for years to come because only now they, we have basically rudimentary versions of destructible environments. Mm -hmm. If you go back, to, go back to Battlefield 2 during the trailers before the game came out, they were advertising destructible environments and never came in place. They took it out of that of Battlefield 2. Now we saw it come back in Battlefield Bad Company two years later. But if it's taking them that long to do the destructible environments, I'm by no means saying that it's an easy task, then perhaps uh, it, it may be a while until we see those kind of things. But beyond those and what I mentioned before in terms of niche maps where it's a bunch of jets or a bunch of tanks, or what if it was like really cool if you had a, a, a map that had a bunch of Vodniks? It was only about Vodniks and Humvees. I think it'd be kind of a cool thing to do. You have some uh, I some of that have the gut turret gunners, some that have the the the, the tow missile, and then it's just it's just not it's just chaos. I'd love to see something like that. And yeah. you, you go you go to like some of the, the the sort of community mod favorite maps back in games like Counter Strike or Quake. They were goofy maps like that. People like that kind of stuff. And they should embrace that kind of you know, that side of things. And I think that's probably what people miss most about the lack of mod tools is the, this variety of maps where people do come up with Vodnik only maps or uh, snowball fight maps or whatever you know where yeah, you have yeah, just yeah. just those silly little things that probably for dice may not be worth the effort it takes to build them. But so that's that's one of the downsides of not having mod tools. Obviously, I hope we can get you on again in the show maybe after Armor Kill's been out and get some of your opinions on on how. Um, our expectations have been met or not met going forward, so I think that would be interesting. Uh, that sounds good. I, I certainly would appreciate it, and I've uh, enjoyed speaking with both of you uh, quite thoroughly on this. Good. I'm glad. Excellent. And um, like I said to everyone else, by the way, um, this will get posted at youtube.com slash battlefieldpodcast. You can follow us on Twitter at BF Podcast. We're on Facebook, Battlefield Podcast. Um, we'll also have it at battlefieldo.com posted in the next couple of days. If you are more into listening to the audio version only that will get posted it will be on itunes as well and of course you can visit our website at battlefieldpodcast.com tim i'm sorry i didn't even notice this until later because it's covered by the lower third but you're wearing the battlefield podcast t-shirt today i am <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome i thought about wearing mine but maybe i'll wear that for the next episode so um speaking of the next episode uh, it will. If it's in two weeks from now, we should have had a chance to play some Armored Kill at that point in time, and we're working on getting some somebody from Dice, maybe as a special guest as well. So we're looking forward to that. Until then, I want to thank everybody who joined us in the chat, um, including some of the folks from the UK who stayed up very late for this. So uh, thanks again to Dascro, and we will see everybody in two weeks. See you guys later.